I'm hopeful that other member organizations of iFound from other countries and other people in the um, fellowship and residency training area, other people who are expert clinicians in OMPT can look at this definition and make a determination as to whether they think it's time to upgrade iFounts again. And I'm hopeful that the work that we did here could positively influence that and move that conversation forward because um, I think it's time. So it is my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Jason Silvernail on our AOMT Hands-On, Hands-Off podcast. And I'm Megan Donaldson. I'm the president of AOMT and a real privilege to have this gentleman talk with us today. And I'm so excited that you said yes, but you're that kind of guy. I, I thought this might be a topic you would like to talk about today. In fact, it's one of my favorite topics, ma'am. I could not be more pleased to be here. <laughs> well, Jason, um, you know, I want to know a little bit more about how you and your group wanted to take on this project and look at OMPT in a re, I would say a reframing, a new modern definition. What inspired you to take on that project? Well, that's a that's a great question. This has just been one of my favorite topics and something I'm just so proud and honored to be able to uh, to be involved with. You know, I've been a physical therapist for, you know, many, many years. Uh, I'm in the U.S. Army where I'm currently a, a colonel on active duty. And so because I'm a colonel in the Army, I have to say everything I talk with you about today is my personal opinion and commentary. It does not reflect the official policy or position of the U.S. Army, the Department of Defense, or the United States government. But it does reflect my personal opinion as Dr. Jason Silvernail. And so I think that, like, I, I guess the story of how this started, I guess there's a long story and a short story. And the long story is that the board of directors at AOMT, which is the U.S member organization of IFOMT commissioned this definition. So this isn't my definition. It's not my author's opinion. This is AOMT's commissioned definition of orthopedic manual physical therapy. That's how this whole thing got started. That's the long story. And the short story is Gail Dial told me to do it or asked me to do it. And I said, yes, because I don't say no to Gail, just like I don't say no to AOMT. So um, I was just been, it's just an amazing honor to be able to you know, sort of bring these this group of like supremely talented and experienced authors who just whose experience just sort of span the spectrum. There's there, we have educators, we've got researchers, we've got expert clinicians, we've got people who are all three, and we were able to pull all these folks together and sit down and say, okay, here is IFOM's definition of what OMPT is. What is our updated definition for this? And it, it was it, one of the things that I think of the most when I think about this project is I think about how different people trained in different ways who come from different like uh, historical traditions of OMPT, maybe we could say, we all agreed on almost everything, almost right away. And there was just, all we had to do was pull all that agreement together and put it together in a way that people can understand. And I think we did a pretty good job. And I know the people at Physical Therapy Journal, hat tip to them, did a tremendous job in the review process of helping us. It turns out that the original IFOM definition we worked for was actually excellent. And we only sort of expanded that in a way that made it easier for people to appreciate and easier for people to recognize maybe when they see it out there in the yeah. And, you know, I think, again, I appreciate you talking about IFOMT because, right, AOMT is this representative body to IFOMT. And so some people don't quite understand, like, okay, well, who is AOMT and what's IFOMT and how does that work with the ABTA? And so, you know, Jason, we just signed our collaborative agreement with ABTA, who now, again, still recognizes us as the body that, um, you know, refers and works with IFOM directly, especially in the area of OMPT practice. So it makes sense that the board would say, hey, we need to make sure that this definition really fits what we're doing, which was the charge. Yeah. And if you think about times, right? I mean, you've been around for a while. There's been this pendulum swing, oh, right? Yes. About what manual therapy is and what it's not, and mostly what people think it, it is. And so, yeah. you know, when, when you think about this article, what, um, you know, and you think about your project, what key changes or advancement in the field do you think prompted um, us to do this charge or that you really felt inspired to take on this project? 
Yeah, I mean, it, that that really is, I think, the, the central question. It's like, why now and what what changes did we make? I think it gave us an opportunity to look again at that di at that definition and really think about of, of all the ways in which we describe what we do, how comprehensive is that is that definition? And can we make that definition more comprehensive and more comprehensible to people? We can. It has to make sense to students. It has to make sense to practitioners, to instructors, to our medical colleagues and other in, in, in other professional groups, to insurance payers. And I think about a lot has changed since iPhone set that definition. And one of the big changes has been really kind of a revolution in how we understand the mechanisms of meal therapy, mm -hmm. where we really had thought, you know, for many many years, maybe even you could make the argument hundreds of years. We thought that manual therapy worked because some mechanical thing was was moved or shifted in the body. And, you know, we got more and more data that said, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. So I think that those sort of mechanisms were a big part of it. And also, we wanted to make sure that at the end of this definition, we provided a way for you to identify it when you saw it. So um, one of the things I like to talk about is that we didn't define manual therapy. We defined it defined orthopedic manual physical therapy. And that's not the same as manual therapy, right? There's a lot of people do manual therapy, you know, and I, you know, I wish them all the best. Mm -hmm. But what I do, what we do is orthopedic manual physical therapy, and we have a definition for that. So we included a conceptual model, which is the actions that people take when they practice OMPT. The actions they take, that's the conceptual model. And then we also included distinguishing characteristics. That means how can you recognize it when you see it? So if you have that distinguishing characteristic list in front of you, and you are, say, uh, um, someone who's writing a clinical practice guideline, you could pull up a randomized clinical trial and say, hmm, does, it ha does this reflect OMPT? Or is this just an exercise trial by somebody who did some hands-on care? And you really will be able to tell the difference uh, with that. And in addition, it gave us the opportunity to provide a patient case. So one of the things that we sometimes run into is that people, especially practicing clinicians, will say, you know, I feel like a lot of this stuff is just sort of, uh, I don't know, maybe it's esoteric or it's hard to get my arms around. How does this apply to me in the clinic? day to day how do how do i apply this with a patient and the patient case allowed us to do that and the people at ptj were, were so kind and allowed us not only the opportunity to create a great definition but to create a companion patient case that helps people understand how to apply it and so i love that because i think that's so important so people can really understand maybe as previous conceptions or misconceptions right and understand that ompt may look different and is maybe applied differently, right? And so in terms of the patient case, do you feel like some of the takeaway really was, did you outline differences? And, and mostly for the, uh, the, our listeners here, do you feel like th that you could distinguish some of the differences, what manual therapy is versus what OMPT is, so that they could really understand the key differences, maybe in their own reading next time that they see a case or a trial, that they can understand those differences? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that as you read the case, you'll see different callouts in the text that explain how what the practitioner is doing applies to the conceptual model or how it applies to the distinguishing characteristics. So you can see it almost like playing it back live, right? It's almost like if you could think about playing the videotape of a clinical encounter with a PT and a patient. And at the bottom, there's those little captions that run across the screen. And that's kind of what those callouts are doing. They're pointing out to you how the model gets applied in real time. And I think that that is going to be a big value for a lot of people in understanding what we mean when we define OMPT. You know, and, and, and Jason, you brought up some other things, which is really thinking about exercise approach, right? And so I'm going to take the time just to ask some more questions about OMPT, because I think that there's that space that people are like, well, mm -hmm you know, manual therapy or OMPT, like, right, you're doing that. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, you don't do that in addition to exercise, like manual therapy alone or exercise alone. But the combination is really what we see right in the literature. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how OMPT definition really is not just doing your hands on, but there's mm -hmm. more to it than that, right? So can you elaborate on why maybe these, this misconception around that manual therapy, orthopedic manual therapy doesn't include, uh, or it does include, right, that progression in thinking about how you're applying 
hands on and then hands off. Yep, that's right. I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think that really that's the core of a lot of the misconceptions I think that we get. And I think, you know, part of it is just a natural evolution of how people's practice uh, uh, gets um, gets adapted as they move along. There are a lot of groups, different professional groups, who do exercise therapy with people beyond just PTs. There are a lot of people who do hands-on therapy of some kind and not just PTs. So there are plenty of people who really just do hands-on or really just do exercise. And there aren't a lot of folks who, who really combine the two well. And I, I think there are some groups outside of PT that might dispute that. And some of that is absolutely fair. There are people out there doing that. But I think in physical therapy and in, in our tradition of care, uh, our hands-on techniques have always been done with a long-term mindset toward exercise and activity. I mean, that is just a key part of who we are uh, in PT. And so one of the things that we tried to lay out is sort of a conceptual model. Here are the, the actions you take. So we have patient-focused interviewing. So I'm not asking you questions just to get my own diagnosis. I'm My focus of the interview is on you as the patient. There's a planned and tailored physical exam, which means I don't just do the same exam to the same person. What I choose to examine and when I choose to examine it and how vigorously my exam is conducted is based on my understanding of the problem that you have that came from that interview, right? There's a targeted exercise prescription. That's again, an action. There's a hands-on skilled therapy, and then there's activity and health coaching. It's not, I heard once a personal trainer put it this way. I don't care how much you can deadlift next week. I care what your blood pressure is in 10 years. And I think like that, that's such a great encapsulation because our, our charge for our patients is not just to get them feeling better right now for this, for this problem they have here, but it's how to follow that along to the rest of their life and keep them as healthy as possible for as long as possible. And that's really the core of the conceptual model of OMPT. Yeah, and I and I loved the distinguishing characteristics, um, you know, as you just hit there, which is this patient-centered, long-term mindset. It's really not just in this one moment or episode of care, right? It carries onward. And then I really appreciate how you just spoke to the OMPT piece being really not just the examination, but how that examination then drives the treatment. Okay. And there is a progression, right? Because if you're mm -hmm. focusing on the judgment, you're reactioning to how they're behaving, whether it's, you know, if they're having more irritable type symptoms or yep. if they're tolerant to the activity and you're able to progress, mm -hmm. but always thinking about kind of the end in mind. And um, again, I, I just really appreciated the way, especially in the paper, right? You have these models and you have great figures by the way, figures and tables are my favorite. Um, but from a structured thinking standpoint, like it helps readers grab a few nuggets that they can really appreciate. And so I really appreciated definitely the patient centeredness yeah. of OMPT. And I think sometimes that gets lost in yes. translation. Yeah. And so kind of as you're writing this, how did you end up landing in that space where patient centered became one of those distinguishing characteristics? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I wonder, would you let me caveat again a little bit more on something we just talked about? And yeah. I think you did a really good job illustrating like how this, this sort of interaction between the patient and the practitioner is sort of iterative and systematic and continuous, right? So I think that a, a big part of some of the discussion around hands-on care, especially over the last several years, has been this idea that manual therapy or hands-on therapy is passive care, meaning the patient just lays there and ideally just sort of is quiet, I suppose, and the practitioner does some things to them, and then after that, something is supposedly different. And, you know, if you're, if you're hearing this right now, and you are a in physical therapy and you practice on PT, you know that that has nothing to do what we do with what we do in the clinic. And it doesn't sound like anything that you've ever been taught. And that sort of continuous interaction is a big part of what makes this process of care not passive. It's active and interactive kind of at all times. So thanks for letting me go back to hit that point. No, absolutely. And I think it's a distinguishing feature of yes. our profession, maybe versus other professions who may be doing a similar type of an approach mm -hmm. in terms of at least the hands-on aspect. It's the integration on patient interaction and patient response to that, right, that, that we really are using in our reasoning. So I really appreciated you outlining that. I know it's very helpful, very helpful. And good to add how it's not just a passive approach. I think there's been some great papers on that too. And, you know, certainly I think we have to highlight 
why that is essential understanding. Um, so, you know, as we think about the impact of a paper. And, you know, Jason, I can totally appreciate you had a rock star group in this group, um, know many of them and colleagues with many of them. Um, you know, I really think you didn't write it just to write the paper, right? You were hoping that there was an impact. And what do you see as maybe the greatest impact that this paper could have? And then maybe we can talk a little bit about where you see this um, maybe next steps going. Yeah, I, I really, I'm hopeful that this has a big impact across the profession in, in, in several different ways. And I think here's a couple of them. So one of the things I would like is to get to a point where physical therapy students start to understand that there is this thing called manual therapy, which is really sort of general, but then there is this approach called OMPT, which is a systematic and active clinical reasoning process. And so when they see those distinguishing characteristics laid out of how to recognize OMPT, and they see that conceptual model, the actions that they take with the patient, they can better understand when they're receiving education, hey, is this person just teaching me some manual therapy or is this person teaching me the process of OMPT? And, and those, things are, those things are very different and, and important. So I'm hopeful that it makes a big difference for students. I'm hopeful that it also makes a big difference for practitioners. So people who are graduated who are already practicing uh, DPTs who look around at the cornucopia of options in the in the uh, uh, continuing medical education route uh, area and say, you know, I if I'm going to choose and plan continuing education to help make me better to make my patients better, how can I choose wisely? And how can I choose a, a recognized path that puts me on a pathway uh, with the potential for fellowship training in the future? And you know, I think Gail Dial put it this way, like OMPT gets trained at all levels of PT education. If you're in an entry level program, they're gonna give you OMPT skills. If you uh, are a graduate and you're out at a CME course, you might get a block of OMPT for a weekend or a week or something like that. You might get OMPT in a residency or in a fellowship. And at each of those levels, as we move up from entry level to CME to residency to fellowship, there is, there is kind of a point estimate, if you'll let me use the statistics uh, expression for a moment. I know that's really what people get excited about on a podcast. So I hope it talks about statistics. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a, a point estimate for what kind of skill we, we are looking for in an entry-level provider who learns OMPT. And then there's a confidence interval around that, right? And ideally, that might overlap with the confidence interval and the point estimate for a graduate person who's pursuing a CME course. And then a residency should have a higher point estimate with the confidence interval around it and so on for fellowship training. And so you can really see OMPT as, as, a, as a step stone approach as you continually develop some of the key things that you need to be uh, the most effective for your patients that you can be. And one of our diagrams kind of uh, shows that sort of stepwise thing. Thank you for, for calling out the diagrams. We worked hard on those. I'm glad. Oh, I, I, I love them. And I'm a, I am guess, you know, I think about myself as probably a good representation of many others that visual learning is a, is a great way mm -hmm. to learn. Um, although I can read papers and do things, but sometimes just having that visual aid, I think is super oh, yeah. helpful. You know, you know, Jason, you bring up something that I really appreciate, which is the master adaptive learning model, right? Which is that we're over time, hopefully getting to a point, or point where lifelong learning is just what we do and we continue to grow, refine and Im improve our practice right to expertise of care. And so I think that this is a great frame so people can understand that this is almost like with, within itself a domain, right? And in that, right, there is plenty of these I would say domains within that, like reasoning and mm -hmm. um, communication practices and other aspects. And so some of that you have written out here, you know, very detailed. Do you see this paper as maybe being a space where as we're looking to maybe think about competency-based education, there's elements in this paper that could help to drive some of those thoughts forward? Yeah. I, and I, I think one of the things that struck me the most about working with this um, absolute all-star author list that AOMS came up with uh, for this uh, is just how similarly we all felt and how aligned we all were on the concept, not only of lifelong learning. I, mean, I think people talk about that, like, oh, I'm a lifelong learner, but, but we can demonstrate how a, a systematic reasoning process like OMPT 
facilitates lifelong learning by providing a stepwise competency ladder that you can climb and that has competencies that can be tested and are reproducible uh, within each trainee and between uh, different trainees to find that point estimate and that confidence interval based on where you are on that ladder. Yeah. And, and, and for our, our listeners, I mean, you have some impressive people in this group, right? So Gail Dial um, is a rock star in his own right in OMPT yeah. and has been longstanding, especially affiliated with the um, Army Baylor program. And again, what a unique model they have, right? But he has trained a ton of people and just excellent, excellent resource. Um, you know, again, I see some of these other authors and, and quite impressive. One that I thought was super interesting is my colleague, uh, uh, Gail Jensen, who is not an OMPT or a fellow or really tied to that, but her passion is education. Yes. And I, I really appreciate she's one who has really subscribed to the Master Adaptive Learning Model. And I am just curious, you know, as you were thinking these things through, did you find that, again, somebody who didn't have that same training could definitely align with the kind of the, the definition and the pathway that you guys were taking? Yeah, I think Gail Jensen clicked right in like a Lego. She, she fully understood um, what we were trying to do in terms of describing this pathway. She okay. fully, like she has a very deep understanding of learning models, of practice models for expertise, of, uh, of the way in which we need to structure our systems to provide a long-term pathway for people, a way that we can describe different levels of expertise and competency in different domains. And she brought all of that to help us with this paper, which was a, which was a great addition. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that insight because I think that, you know, we are just starting to really think about um, you know, how we need to recognize maybe even the language differences, right? So people say manual therapy, and that's oftentimes because it's identified as a CPT code. And this is what students are introduced to, right? And sometimes they forget manual therapy is really a, a whole process, not just a technique. And some people are trained that it's a technique. And so, you know, as you're thinking about educators, so I know what you think about the student side, and I know what you're thinking about from the practitioner side. How do you think this paper could be used in entry-level educational settings? Well, what I'm hopeful of is I'm hopeful that our entry-level faculty, well, first of all, you know, if they're faculty in a DPT program, they understand a lot about human education, how people learn, and all of these things. So I don't think there's anything here that's going to be like a surprise to a faculty member. But what I'm hopeful is, is that they'll be able to see in this definition they'll see in this description the kinds of progressive competencies that they already understand from other contexts and are able to apply that to OMPT, such that when they're teaching students OMPT competencies, they don't just do one part of it. So let's look at the distinguishing characteristics, for example. That's how you can identify OMPT. We have five, advanced specialty training, focus on clinical judgment, expertise in exam, expertise in treatment, patient-centered long-term mindset. So if they're teaching the expertise in treatment part, which is totally okay, and I spent plenty of time learning all that from Gail and others, um, that wasn't it. That wasn't the only thing we did. And so I'm hopeful that the educator would look at that and think, oh, I can't just teach them that. I also need to include some of those other distinguishing characteristics if I'm going to call it OMPT. And how do I choose what actions I want the student to be able to demonstrate? Well, here's our conceptual model that leads them to the right kinds of actions to take. And I'm hopeful that they can look at those things and read the paper and be able to see, I immediately see how I can take my uh, block of instruction in manual or OMPT care for patients, and I can structure it like that so that it makes sense for that definition. And I'm hopeful that they find that that's a more, that's a more complete way to teach, and it's a way that more closely aligns with uh, the tenets of OMPT. That's, that's a great segue to my next question, which is, what do you want next out of this paper in terms of opportunities to influence change? Yeah. Well, you know, one of, one of the things that, one of the areas I'm hopeful to get change in is in the areas of how we interpret and summarize evidence for recommendations and in systematic reviews. And, you know, so like probably many people listening, um, you know, I, I've been on expert panels, I've developed clinical practice guidelines, I've participated in systematic reviews, 
And I can tell you, you know, behind some of those closed doors, when you get people who aren't really closely understanding of OMPT, you get a lot of folks who want to slice and dice things in different groups. And I've been in a clinical practice guideline group where they said, well, this study here, this had manual therapy, so we're going to put it in the manual therapy bucket. I'm like, well, but it also had exercise. You're not going to put it in the exercise bucket? Well, no, that had hand, but it had hands-on care, though. I'm like, wait, so why are we using that one thing to make the definition and to make that and to make that distinction? Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things people have talked about about in this area for some time is that they said, oh, well, you've got this definition paper, you and all your people, but you know, you guys are all manual therapy people, so you're you're biased toward manual therapy. Uh, okay, let's talk about it. Well, what do we mean when we say bias? Well, I, I think sort of a a quick summary or a blue collar quick explanation of bias is that I'm treating one thing of a, out of a list differently for no good reason. Mm-hmm. So when we looked at our distinguishing characteristics, expertise and treatment is only one of the five. And we're treating that treatment. We are, we are categorizing it. We are describing it. We're exposing it to scrutiny to the exact same level of scrutiny and attention that we have to a patient-centered long-term mindset, say, or advanced subspecialty training. And when people are a little bit nervous or or concerned about this definition, they never seem to call those things out. They never seem to raise their hand and say, you know, I've got a problem. I think you're biased toward patient-centered long-term mindset. No one has ever said that to me, right? They've only focused on the hands-on part of it. So I I guess at the end of all that is what I'm saying is some people come to this definition biased but it's not us because we're treating all of those those characteristics with the same level of rigor and and care. And I'm hopeful that when we get to the clinical practice guideline or systematic review stage, that people who are doing this kind of work will be able to look and recognize the difference between a trial of OMPT and a trial of manual therapy. Because I think, and I think you think, and many of the people who are listening along, we believe that OMPT provides higher value in different care, and we already have quite a bit of evidence to demonstrate that. And oh, by the way, we linked it in the paper. Right. Well, I'm going to circle one more question, and then we'll wrap this up. Okay. So, you know, you started off by saying IFOMT has the definition. So you've created one from that definition, and you have a more co- comprehensive description associated with it. How do you think this paper could be used to maybe influence the practice of OMPT internationally. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, other member organizations of IFOM from other countries and um, other people in the um, fellowship and residency training area, other people who are expert clinicians in OMPT can look at this definition and make a determination as to whether they think it's time to upgrade IFOM again. And I'm hopeful that the work that we did here could positively influence that and move that conversation forward because um, I think it's time. I, I, one of the things that I thought about as I reviewed the older definition that I found provided was just kind of how ahead of its time it was and how impressive and detailed that it was. And so the opportunity to add on to that and to bring that and to bring in some, some new knowledge and new descriptions of, of practice to that it was just an amazing opportunity, and it was a great honor to be able to to sit on that panel, uh, to have those conversations with that uh, you know uh, most expert group, uh, and to be able to publish that paper. It was really a great experience. Well, Jason, thank you so much for you know first of all your work here and your dedication to the profession. Um, thank you for your service always and all that you stand for and represent for our country. So grateful to you um, and so grateful for just the conversation today, right, where we can have some candid conversation about what was behind the mind that yes. created the paper and some of the challenges and things you all had to work through. And then to me, really thinking about where's the influence and the opportunity for us to be a better version of where we are now, five years from now, a paper like this, right, that really helps to give some shape with some outline structure that helps multiple audience from a student to practicing clinicians to educators and maybe even thinking about organizations that then structure themselves. So AOMT um, is definitely one that's benefited from this. So thank you for that. And I hope that IFOMT will also have an opportunity to consider if this is something that they would like to, you know, consider for adoption and or review or sharing. And so, um, you know, is it IFOMT recently and they have some incredible people there and I'm certain that uh, there will be opportunities for those collaborations. 
I look forward to it. Yeah. Well, Jason, thank you so much for joining us on the AOM Hands-On, Hands-Off podcast. Uh, it's a newer podcast, so we're always looking to make sure we're getting some more listeners and opportunities to share awesome speakers and the work that they're doing. So thank you for making that time tonight, and I appreciate you.